And so get a little bit more in depth with some of the protocols, uh, some of the communication methods, things that actually go over the wire, places to put things in your theater, how to stop, put things uh, in your theater, the different types of managed switches, things like that. Uh, that should take us to lunch. When we get back from lunch, we'll put even more gear on your desk. Uh, and we're going to start looking through our concert uh, network management software. So we'll do an entire lecture just going through and taking a look. And then we'll finish up that uh, section with another class, which is more of a lab style. So we'll work our way through uh, commissioning all of the different pieces in the ETC system, RDM devices, gateways, things like that. Uh, and then we will finish off the day with a class on Net3 Conductor, uh, which is a product so cool it gets its own class. I had so. two different people walk up to me at the picnic last night and say, I went through the conductor class, and now I want to buy one. And I call that a victory. <laughs> it is no small secret that my end goal, <laughs> my evil plan, is to get it to a point where it's, welcome to ETC, here's your conductor. What else would you like in your system? <laughs> um, it's a really cool product. We'll be referencing it throughout uh, most of the classes, and then we'll spend a whole class just delving through all the cool things it can do. Um, so with that in mind, taking a look at being really rude, look at my phone here. We are on time. We are awesome. on time. Uh, yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, the fantastic Mr. David Fox. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. That was like so much better. See, that I, I really like an interactive and participatory class. And now you can say that you like you can check that off. If there was a pin for participating in David's class, you all just got it. But there isn't a pin. Uh, welcome, those of you that are online. Uh, I, my name is David Fox, training and documentation specialist at ETC. I'm the guy in the small window next to your Facebook page right now. As you're, uh, as you've totally decided to live stream this, and then you know. We're about a minute and a half in, so attention span is gone when it comes to the internet if you're anything like me. Uh, I'll try and keep it at least moderately lively and move occasionally. Uh, for those of you that are in the class, I'll try to keep it even more lively because you know, you're stuck in the room with me. Um, as I said, um, I'm a training and documentation specialist. What my job is to do, aside from random other duties as assigned slash David Fox type stuff, is as we develop new product, as we develop new ideas and concepts, I develop the curriculum that we train and teach our authorized service provider network. So the people that are coming out and servicing your systems, installing your gear, typically have to put up with like five or six days of my classes um, to learn how to go off and do that. So it's my fault. No. Take that as a compliment, take that as, a, as what it will. Uh, but today, you know, you just get the bonus 70 minute version. So what we're going to talk about, as Lola had said, is really to kind of set that base not layer of understanding. Some of this may be stuff you've already dealt with. How many of you have touched a computer before? <laughs> All right, excellent. You know, I try to ask questions that lets everybody raise their hand at least once. So, so you know, we'll see how many times I do that. Uh, we're going to talk about network wiring, pra network practices. We're going to talk about wiring practices. We'll talk about some of ETC's network ready products. You're going to get a lot more details as you go through the rest of the day today. But again, my job is to kind of set a base layer of understanding. So when they say we're going to talk about this, you understand at least enough of it that. Tracy can delve into the weeds on some of the deeper things. I make fun of Tracy because he sits in the back of the class. I like to say things and then judge his face to see how wrong I was. So we'll see how, how well that works. Um, it's kind of fun. It's like ending sentence with a preposition. It bugs him too. Uh, we'll also talk through uh, some network addressing schemes and some common network devices. Depending on how many questions you have, obviously I'll cover any questions that come up. Um, and if we run short on time, um, I've got some bonus amount of material that we may or may not get to, but is on a copy of the presentations that is on your USB sticks. So if we don't get to it, you can go and look at the pictures, and I script every PowerPoint I do so you can read what I would have said, only it won't be as funny, or maybe funnier. It's, it's kind of hard to say, because this is about as funny as I get. So let's talk about networking basics first. Uh, before we get into product, before we get into actually connecting stuff or, or physically dealing with computers or, or software, what is networking? Right? When we're talking about networking and we're talking about ba uh, the networking basics, I define networking as communication between any two nodes or any two or more devices. It's, it's really the, the basis of integrating those devices from multiple manufacturers or from multiple product families and getting them to a point where when you put them all together, when you connect them all up, they have the ability to talk to one another. What they're saying is less important when you look at a networking view than actually getting them to talk. And, and that's, that's really where networking comes together. We're looking at the communication of those multiple devices. We're looking at ways to integrate them together. We work, oh, my laser works in this room. That's great. Um, one of the other classrooms had a backlit screen, so I kept pointing the laser, and I couldn't figure out why it wasn't working. <laughs> I go off on tangents, sorry. And I'm standing where you can't see me, and that's rude. But now I can't see the slides. 
Oh no. Uh, oh, so uh, we'll talk about wiring. Uh, wiring is important, right? You have to connect the devices together. So typically we use wire for that. It's scientific. Uh, we'll talk through data distribution as well. Uh, the nice thing about networking and the nice thing about distributing the data with networking is it's typically fairly simple and flexible. It's a thing a lot of contractors understand if you're putting upgrades into your facility or you're working with new product, which also makes it easy to expand. The, the nice thing about putting in a network infrastructure is if you know your gear is going to be network or ethernet ready um, at that point, you know that you can expand using the same wiring plant and continue to grow your system without having to pull a lot of custom wire or redo a lot of things. Make sense so far? Mm -hmm. All right, if you got questions, feel free to raise a hand and I'm more than happy to answer them. So when we talk about ethernet and before we start talking about the physicalities of the wire, the, the communication layers specifically, I, I want to kind of define Ethernet because Ethernet is, means a lot of things to a lot of people. Um, and, and Ethernet is, is really defined as a family of networking technologies that work together for creating what's called a local area network or a LAN. So when you're dealing with Ethernet, it doesn't mean the internet, it doesn't mean addressing, it doesn't mean Apple, it doesn't mean wireless. It's the series of protocols that live together that allow these individual devices to talk to one another. The important thing when you're looking at Ethernet devices is Ethernet doesn't define what's on the wire. It doesn't define how these things are communicating to each other. It, it defines how they're, how they're going to communicate together. So it's not what they're saying, it's how they're going to say it. It's how they're going to greet each other. It's how they're going to deal with conflicts on the line. That's, that's what the Ethernet protocols are really all about. The, the common form of Ethernet in a theatrical system takes place over twisted pair wiring, or Cat5, Cat6, Cat7 wire. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a couple of minutes. But that's, that's the kind of the, the physical layer, if you will, of how an Ethernet network comes together. If you want to read more about this, because boy, I just made it sound super exciting, right? If you want to read more about it, um, what you can look at is there's a number of standards that have been published. The standard that we follow, the standard that really defines what Ethernet is, is IEEE, IEEE 802.3. Um, the IEEE is the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers. So, you know, as exciting as that group sounds, um, I can imagine their meetings are, are just as wild as this one right now. And they're all watching and they just all kill David's internet. Um, <laughs> but that's, that's where the standards come from. So if you really want to look at them, you can. Um, I found it useful when I was putting the class together. Sometimes knowing a little bit about that standard is enough so that you can win the fight with your IT people when they don't want to do something and you can say, ah, but the standard says blah, blah, blah. And they're like, oh God, they know what they're talking about. I better, I better do something. No offense to IT people. So let's get into the wiring. Let's talk a little bit about the physical layer. Um, this is the most important part, right? If you don't have a way to connect these devices together, it doesn't matter how they're going to talk to one another. So I want to get in and first talk about the, the, one of the most important and usually overlooked aspects of putting a network together, and that's the wiring. What we're typically looking at in, in most systems is Ethernet over twisted pair wire. So we're getting that communication taking place over this. This is a fairly inexpensive cable. Um, it's getting cheaper and cheaper because it's being used more and more and more and more. So telling a contractor or getting a bid specification for a new project and saying you want to run Cat5 or Cat6 or Cat7 or whatever wire everywhere is something most, most contractors understand and have you know pallets of spools so that they're ready to deal with it. They know how to terminate it. They know how to do all those things. It's a lot easier than dealing with a lot of the specialty wires like DMX or Link Connect or things of that nature. So it gives you it's something better to understand. The two most common that we run into are 10 or 100 based T based wires. You'll see this actually printed on the wire itself. If you're not finding these things printed on the wire that you're getting, if it doesn't have these numbers or it doesn't say Cat5, Cat6, Cat7E, it won't say all of that, it'll say one of them, it depends on the standard. Um, if you're not seeing that on your wire, you should get cautious because it means you're not actually getting certified or rated wire. So that is one of the things to look at. Uh, maximum distance whenever you're dealing with any runs of this nature is uh, 100 meters or 328 feet. This is, an, this is not, this is, I mean, how do I want to phrase this? I know what I wanted to say, what do I actually mean? That's always a difficulty for me. This is an IEEE 802.3 rule. This is not anything specific to ETC or anything specific for individual manufacturers. They just specify no more than 328 feet is your maximum distance between any two devices. That's not 
total wire in the system that's just from node to other node is what we're looking at for rules. Bear this in mind if you are running cable or data cables or let's say you have a front of house network jack that you use sometimes to connect a remote to and you're grabbing that 300 foot ethernet cable and plugging it in and then you can't figure out why that device isn't working, I bet I know why. Um, so remember you're dealing with a total distance of 328 feet between devices and that's all the wire you're looking at. When we're looking at the wire itself, as I said before, you're going to see one of these numbers. It's either going to say 10 or 100 or now 1,000 for some of the, the Cat6 and Cat7 stuff, uh, typically a base and a T. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about what those numbers mean because, you know, you're in the class and you, you paid your money to learn some technical stuff. So let's, uh, let's talk about those. The first one you're going to see is speed. And what that means when you're looking at that on the wire is that determines megabits per second. So regardless of what you're connecting to, that is as fast as that wire is going to be able to process the data. So if you have 10 base T wire on a gigabit switch, it's not going to get any faster, right? So that's, that's one thing to be aware of, is to look at the speed of that. Uh, so that the first one is your speed. The next one determines the signal type that that wire is rated for, either baseband or broadband. Uh, I'm sure everybody's heard the term broadband before. If you have a cable modem in your house, that's a broadband cable modem. Um, you also have baseband. The difference between the two bands is a baseband system, and this is an oversimplification, so everybody who's online who's quickly hitting the Wikipedia and checkmarking all the red X's where I'm wrong, um, understand these are some simplifications. You can definitely learn more about this. Uh, baseband refers to single points of communication between devices, whereas broadband refers to segmented packets for multiple devices communicating with each other on that same piece of wire. Broadband cable modem goes back to a head end somewhere in your neighborhood. You and all your neighbors are sharing that data link. In a theatrical lighting network or in a baseband system, you don't need to worry about that because you don't have several different separate sources all trying to access different kinds of data at the same time. So that's, that's the difference between those two. And last but certainly not least, you're going to see the T, and that refers to the cabling type, twisted pair. So that's what that means when you're looking at the cable. Anybody not know that? Everybody knew that. One person didn't know. All right, good. I feel better. I feel better. I feel it. Too fast, too slow. So far, so good. Good. Got a couple of thumbs up. No yawns yet. All right. Uh, so the next thing I want to talk about are connectors. Uh, any connectors that we're dealing with use the RJ45 or recommended jack number 45 uh, for all terminations. Uh, so females, it is specified in the IEEE, in the 802.3 standard, that any hard-coded or hard piece of equipment uses a female connection. So if you're looking at a console, you're looking at a node, you're looking at a gateway, you're looking at a switch, those are all female connections. And any extension cables, patch cables, or things of that nature are male on both ends. Why do they do this? Those of you that were in my why did the data cross the cable class yesterday cannot answer because we talked about it. Anybody want to hazard a guess? Yes. So does it matter which end you put in? Doesn't matter which end gets plugged in where. Sorry? There, yeah, there is some more cabling. It comes, in, in a, but the big portion that it comes down to is stability. I'm moving back. Don't worry about moving the camera. Sorry, I forgot. Um, sorry, everybody. They were all like, where did he go? <laughs> that was the time for the monster to come across the screen if I'd thought about it. Um, that would have been funny. Uh, what it comes down to is mating cycles. That's, that's really the biggest reason, um, is a female RJ45 connection is rated for 2,500 to 3,000 connections before it is going to be considered um, broken or failing or degrades. A male RJ45 connection is only rated for about 500 connections before it breaks. So if you're in my house um, and your, my son comes over and goes, look, Daddy, I made shovels, um, then you can get rid of all of your cables, right, because they broke all the little tabs off. I'm sure there's a joke about mating cycles that lives in there somewhere, uh, but it's an early morning and it's a PG class because it's rated uh, or because it's being streamed. Uh, but that's the big thing. Uh, here's a joke. I think it's a funny joke. What do you call a male RJ45 cable with the plastic tabs broken off of it? Garbage, <laughs> right? If you get if you find a cable that has those tabs broken off of it, throw it away. Just throw it away, because now what's going to happen? You're going to plug that into some really crucial piece of gear in your show, and somebody's going to trip over it, and they're going to pull it out, and now you don't have any connection at all. The tab breaks. It's garbage. 
Tracy prefers um, using his I got your hand your subtle hand signal there. Uh, cut the ends off before you throw it away. Uh, somebody in the last class was like, "I'll cut the ends off and I'll re-terminate it." And if you want to do that, go for it. Um, but I just I throw them away. Um, sometimes I remember to cut the ends off. Sometimes I just bury them in the gross part of the trash can. Um, I figure if somebody's willing to dig for it at that point, you know, game on, I suppose. But but yeah, if they break, they're trash. Because once that tab comes off, you can't put it back on in any good way. So when we're terminating that wire, there's a couple of different standards to work to look at. Um, AT&T came up with these standards a long time ago um, in part of the telecom industry. It's, the, it's a termination style T568. There's an A and a B version of the style. Um, you can tell by looking at here the real difference is just how some of the wires go together and what the wiring code is. In the US, typically you're looking at people using the T568B standard. In truth, it really doesn't matter which standard you're using on the cable as long as you terminate both ends the same way. Right? It is a bad day when you're installing stuff in the field and you come back after having terminated half a theater and say, yeah, I terminated everything to B, and the other person you're working with is like, I terminated everything to A. <laughs> wah, wah, wah. Right? That's not a good time, right? Because you just made all these cables that are backwards. So that's the big thing is if you're making your own cable, you will see, to step back a slide, on every female connection, you will see a color code where, next to all of the pins that shows A and B. So you can figure out which one you want to use. As long as it's terminated the same way on both ends, it doesn't matter which standard you use. And if you've terminated one cable with A and one cable with B, it still doesn't matter which way as long as it's the same on both ends. Question? Uh, what do you teach your service tech? We teach our service technicians to do the B standard. We, we ratified on the B standard, boy, what, 15, 16 years ago, guys? Longer than you guys have been at ETC? Longer than they've been at ETC. So, so a while ago, I mean, it's like 16 plus years ago, we decided to start using the B standard and that's what we tell people to use. If you get some place in the A standard has been used, that's fine. Just, and if you do the same thing, just, just follow it. right? Whatever it's been wired out on one end, just make sure it's wired out on the other and it's fine. If you don't do that, what you end up creating is what's called a crossover cable. Uh, some of you may have heard of crossover cables before. I see a bunch of people nodding their heads. Crossover cables were really, really popular um, in some of the early days of Ethernet networking before you have a lot of hubs and switches and networking products. The time that I used these quite a bit was Obsession 2 face panels and a single processor system because you needed to get some kind of a network cable that went back and forth between those two things. And if you had a hub, you'd plug it into the hub. But if you didn't, you'd use what was called a crossover cable. And what that's basically doing is taking your send pair and taking your receive pair and flipping one end so that when you connect the two devices together, your send is on one, the send on one end is going to the receive on the other and vice versa so that they can talk to one another. That's, that's how a crossover cable works. In all of ETC's modern networking equipment, which is pretty much everything you're going to be playing with and learning about in these classes, we include uh, self-switching ports. So you don't need to worry about putting in a crossover cable anymore. If you're plugging your computer directly into a product or something, they're going to sense what, whether or not they're getting communication and they're going to automatically switch on the inside. So you probably don't need these as much anymore as maybe you used to. How many of you still carry one anyway? A number of people carry one anyway. I had and then totally forgot to bring today, so I'm minus a prop. Sorry. Um, uh, but I, I have a little device that I carry that's actually a, a multi adapter, which is it's got a, a dial wheel on the side, and I can make it a crossover cable or a loopback cable or whatever I need it to do. ThinkGeek.com used to sell them. It's really cool and handy. Now I wish I'd brought it in. I probably shouldn't have talked about it. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, that, that's, that's a bonus for the people that are now quickly adding a new tab to their browser in the stream and, and going to ThinkGeek and trying to type in the cable to find it. Did I see a hand go up? No? Just uh, there, perfect. We started adding the self switching ports um, in Paradigm products. That was the first product we put them in. Well, when did we start incorporating them into everything else? Do you remember? About nine years ago is Lil's answer for those of you that are online. It's been a steady pace ever since then. Yeah. So are we at a point where we have anything that we're currently selling that doesn't have a self-switching port on it? I do not believe so. I'm not even sure you can buy a chip anymore that doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. Most, most products that these, at this point are able to do it and support it. 
if you've got net two nodes, it's probably still a good idea to have a crossover cable if you don't have some kind of switching gear in your system. Um, if you've got express, expression, obsession, uh, those those might require a crossover cable, um, but also in the, specifically in the software of the Obsession and the Express, you have the ability to swap pairs. Um, in the, oh, sorry, ex, yeah, ex, Obsession and Express gave you the ability to do it in software. In obs, Expression, uh, twos and threes, you can switch some dip switches on the back and you can swap the pairs at the console if you don't have a crossover cable. So if you're dealing with something older than that, just add a switch and that solves a lot of the problems as well. Uh, but that's kind of the, the issues of the cable. Uh, the other cable that you may run into is fiber. Does anybody have fiber in their facility? I got a couple of people nodding their heads yes. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about that. Fiber optic cable is used when you need to break out past that 328 feet rule. Or let's say you have two different buildings. I've seen this at universities. I see this at, at large complexes. Right? You've got several buildings that are interconnected together and you need to get a fairly long distance. Uh, one of my favorites was we did uh, a city park with an ETC lighting system that was being controlled from the courthouse a mile and a half away. So there was this whole network infrastructure in the park for all of the control, but or for all of the actual fixtures and nodes and stuff, but when they actually went in to control it, they were controlling it from the basement of a building quite a distance away. So there was a single fiber line that ran over to where we needed it to go so that we could get to the control point. Um, and that's what fiber is really good for, is being able to transmit data over long distances. Fiber works differently than copper in that it's, well, it's fiber. Um, so you're dealing with a laser, and what that laser is doing is it, you're, you're sending pulses of, you convert the electronic signals into light pulses and then you convert them back so you can get a much further distance because light travels quickly and far. Maybe you've known that before. If you go outside tonight and you look up, that's like proof of my theory. So, <laughs> yeah, it's science. Um, so there's a couple of different uh, speeds that you might be dealing with, either, either 10 or 100 megabit, uh, depends on the fiber. Uh, a couple of things if you're dealing with and trying to troubleshoot fiber, because fiber works great until it doesn't. Um, so the first thing that I always try, that I'll try to do if I'm having problems with a fiber connection, the, the very first thing I will do is I will go to one side of that fiber link and just simply swap the pairs. Whenever you're dealing with fiber, you've got two pieces of wire that you're dealing with. So that's like, that's problem number one. If you only get one piece of fiber, they're like, here's your fiber, you're like, yeah, where's the other one? Right, because you have a transmit line and you have a receive line. So if you have two wires, which you should, and you're not getting communication, go to one side of that fiber line and just swap them. I, it's, it's really simple to accidentally swap your transmit and receive because you can't really tell by you know, looking at them or listening to them um, what they're doing. So just try swapping them first and see if that works. Um, if that's still not working, uh, you can get the gear closer to one another, trying to troubleshoot uh, and then network problem from a mile and a half away is a lesson in frustration slash patience. Uh, and so if you can move the gear closer together, that helps. Other thing to look at is, and this is another big one that I've run into, is are those two pieces of gear the same make and speed? So on either side of that fiber line, you have a transceiver that is converting electronic signal to light and then light to electronic signal. And if they're different speed devices or they're different manufacturers or they're different makes, that can cause you some problems. And that can be a, a bit of a gotcha. And that sometimes gets tricky because you didn't, we didn't provide that gear. You may not have even specified it. Your IT department went in and put that in and they went, oh, well, we need fiber. Well, we have these things on the shelf. We'll just pull these down and use them because those are expensive. And suddenly you get a 10 megabit on one side and a 100 megabit on the other. And they're never going to talk to each other. So that's a big thing to look at with them. Um, and, and last but not least is, is stay away from the light. Right? Remember, when you're dealing with fiber, one of the easiest ways to troubleshoot fiber is to see if there's light coming out of the end. Right, so you can disconnect it and you can see if there's light coming out. Don't keep it unplugged for too long or you'll fill the room with ones and zeros and it's a mess to clean up. Um, <laughs> but, but a big thing is, you know, look and see if there's light coming out of it. But don't do that by looking at it. Right, that's a one-time thing. Two, if you're dumb. No offense to, to dumb people. Um, but, but, you know, don't look in the light. Hold it into your hand. Hold it against the wall. Don't point it at your buddy. Hey, is this working? Why are you screaming? Um, <laughs> so those are the big things to be aware of. Is it, You are dealing with the laser, so you want to take appropriate safety. But that's, that's another good troubleshooting step, right? If you, if you point it at your hand and you don't see light, 
that's probably the first thing you should try to fix. Any questions on fiber? Any questions on data so far? So far so good? All right. Uh, so let's talk about network components and some topology. We've talked a little bit about how the wiring works. Let's, let's talk about how some of these things come together. Uh, there's three components that exist in a networking system. Only three, right? That's it. Always only three. Um, that's kind of quasi-funny and quasi-true, right? Because if you're looking at all the gear on your table, you're like, three, that's nuts. Um, but it's true. We have three different things. Uh, you're either looking at nodes, some kind of switching, and then last but not least in that component is the topology of how those devices go together. So a node is an active electronic device that is connected to the network, whether that is a piece of gear like all of these fine networking products that we sell and you'll be able to play with while you're here at Q, or maybe you own. How many people own w at least one of the things on that page? At least two of the things on that page? Three? Oh, thank you, man. My kid gets to go to a good school. <laughs> um, so those of you that didn't, the eyes of a child, man. Think about it. <laughs> so nodes, they're active electronic devices that exist on the network. This is, this is not the same as like a plug-in station on your wall. That's not an active device. That's just a place where cable passes through. A brush panel and a switch, that's not an active device. Those are considered passive devices. This, an active device or a node is something that is passing data. And this can get confusing because ETC sells a bunch of things that we call nodes. One of the reasons why we're not calling them nodes anymore is, is because of that, is some of that confusion. Because a node is a computer term for any of these things. In terms of, your, of a computer device, these are all considered to be nodes. Does that make sense to everybody? The other devices that you'll run into is a switch. So a switch is the device that's going to live in the system. This is what everything connects back to. And we'll talk about topology in a moment as we talk about how these things come together. But the switch lives or, or switches live in the center of your nodes. All of your individual nodes are going to connect back to the switch. And what switches do is they route traffic and they limit bandwidth down so that we're not spamming everything. Switches are different than hubs. And a hub was an older piece of network gear. The way a hub worked is everything that went into it went out to every device that was connected to it. And that worked great in the 90s. But as more and more pieces came online and as we needed to start segmenting traffic down, that didn't work so well. So that's where switches came in. What switches do is they create something that is referred to as a device table. So they learn everything that is currently connected to them. And then they route traffic between those devices. So if you wanted to talk to him, you could, too could have that conversation without everybody else at the table hearing. That, and that way you're not all getting spammed and not able to hear me because those two are talking. Although I'm sure it would be interesting. Um, so we're looking at direct communication. Um, it also can handle multicast addressing, which either I will talk about, depending on how much time we have, or one of the other people in, in one of the other tracks will get a chance to talk about it. Um, but it'll handle multicast addressing per port. There's two types of switches that exist out there in the world. You either have a managed switch or an unmanaged switch. So unmanaged switches pretty much will work out of the box and are designed to just purely route any traffic that goes through them to the other devices based on their device table. Managed switches have a lot more connectivity in them. They allow you to configure individual ports. They allow you to add security. They block traffic. They allow traffic. They do all kinds of things. They involve some level of configuration. Um, typically, people know which one they have. Right, uh, but if you're if you're looking for switches, depending on what your infrastructure is, or depending on how your IT department is wiring stuff, if you don't get to own the network infrastructure in your facility, um, make sure you know what kind of switch you got. Because if you're getting a managed switch, there's certain ports that you want to make sure are opened to allow for ETC and lighting traffic, or audio traffic, or any of the other specific industry-based traffics to pass through. A managed switch may by default block all of those. So you can see the device, you can find it in concert, and then when you go to turn your console on, nothing happens because it's blocking that, that level of traffic. Does that make sense to everybody? OK, so the next thing is before we get in specifically into topology I want to talk about is a segment. A network segment is a very fancy IT technical term that refers to all of the wire between your nodes. So every bit of wire, whether it's in the wall or the patcher extension cables, all of the wire that exists between a node and a switch 
because everything's going node to switch. You're not going node to node unless you have a crossover cable. Everything's going node to switch. The total amount of wire that exists in that is referred to as a network segment. This is, this is the term IT may use when they're talking about things. That's where that 328 feet or 100 meter rule comes from. No network segment can be longer than that. If it is, it's breaking 802.3, uh, which means that you may not find communication working. Yes? Does that include devices that function as extenders on network? Uh, the, the question was, does that include devices that function as extenders on network? Um, the answer is yeah, but no, but yeah. So, so, so let me explain. If you are adding some kind of a network extension device, so let's say I was coming out of a switch and I wanted to put a network extender in, I would not want to run that network extender more than 328 feet from that switch. Then from that network extender, I could run an additional 328 feet out to additional nodes. So one of the things that you have to be aware of when you start dealing with network extensions or multiple switches is, is the number of hops between devices, um, and I'm trying to remember what that number is. Anyone in the back, do you remember how many hops are allowed between segments? Ish? There isn't really a, I mean, the true maximum number is 255. The practical right. number that we expect on a network is six or less. Right, so you're looking at less, you know, no more than six hops or six network segments between any two devices. That's a pretty good rule of thumb. Um, but yeah, if you're adding network extenders, and I know I did it in my house for a while because I have a trying to get internet or ethernet communication all through my, my house was tricky. Um, that's, that's where extenders can come into play. So typically those are going to be wired if you're starting to deal with other things like power line and stuff like that. That's, like, that's, a, that's a lunchtime conversation because it's way out of the weeds of this class. Did you have a comment? No? All right. You don't know. consider hops, do you consider that also from, say, the switch to a, a wall jack, and then from that jack to a, a node, or you see what I'm saying? Like, does that consider yeah, I, hops well, or is that considered a continuous cable? Sure. Joseph, Joseph's question was, um, is it a hop or a segment when we are going from the switch to a wall connection to an extension cable to a node? Right, is that, is that considered, is that considered a, a, a hop or is that considered a segment? And it's a segment, right? So when you're looking at a segment, what you are, whoop, wrong button, um, technical difficulties. So what you're looking at here with that segment is between your node and your switch, you are looking at the total amount of wire that exists there. And this can be a bit of a gotcha, especially if you're setting up a tech table in the middle of your house where you've got that you know, down left or down right network jack and you're connecting a 150 foot network cable so that you can get into the middle of your house to it, be aware of how much wire exists in the system. How many of you have uh, certified Cat5 networks in your facility? A couple of hands are going up. Uh, for those of you that aren't really sure what that means, um, that's totally fine, I'll explain. Uh, during an installation process, you can get a network certified, which means that in addition to terminating all of the wire, somebody comes through and runs tests on every single line. And typically, as a portion of that certification, they either issue a report, or more commonly, you'll find a printed sticker on every network jack that exists everywhere in the facility that lists the distance between that network jack and the closest switch. Um, and if, so now how many people have a certified network? Any additional hands go up? More hands went down, that's kind of scary. Um, <laughs> okay, uh, but that'll give you that distance, right? So, you know, what I'd, and we'll, I'll talk about tools a little bit as we go a little further through the presentation, but I'd recommend if you don't know the answers to some of those questions, especially if you're doing a lot of long remote connections between nodes, is you can use some test tools or borrow a buddy's test tools and test those out so that you know how long of an extension cable you can add to that network jack before you've crossed over that 328 feet. Sometimes you can go quite a ways and other times I've run into some situations, especially long, like back of house and stuff like that if your equipment racks in your booth, where you may not be able to attach more than a 25 foot piece of cable to that network jack because you've hit the end. Can you fix that? Sure, put a switch, right? Add another switch, then you've created a hop and at that point, you can run an additional 328 feet from there. And you can buy switches fairly inexpensively. Best Buy will get you a switch for under 100 bucks these days. Does that make sense to everybody? Does that answer your question? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Excellent. 
Uh, so when we're looking at that topology, again, just to talk about it, when we're looking at how these segments come together, uh, they connect in what's referred to as essentially a, a, a star topology, or what I like to think of as the dancing man topology, because this kind of looks like a dancing man. And you're all going, that doesn't look anything like a dancing man. But what you all will now remember is that it didn't look like a dancing man, and that's the star topology. What we're talking about is essentially all of your nodes, no matter how many of them you're adding into the system, are all home running individually back to a switch. You cannot go node to node to node to switch. Everything's going back to the switch. There are a few times where you might look at how equipment goes together and say, well, that doesn't work the way David said. Specifically, if you are going to a sensor three rack or a paradigm processor, which has an ethernet connection on the front of it and plugging into that. But aha, what you didn't know is that those devices have a single port self-sensing switch in them. So at that point, when you are plugging into the front of a paradigm processor, you've actually just created a hop in a new network segment. So that's how that works together. But everything's home running back to the switch. That's, that's the topology that is required for any Ethernet-based communication that you're working with. And the way that works is we filter the traffic. So if I get a message into that switch from node 1, it's going to read through its device table to say, OK, node 1 is trying to talk to node 3. How do I route that traffic? Well, it's going to come into the switch. The switch looks at the device table and says, node 3 is connected to this port on me. So therefore, I'm going to route that traffic out specifically to node 3. Uh, you get a couple of really nice advantages here. Number one, you keep your traffic down so that every device doesn't have to listen to it, so you can keep bandwidth moving faster. And number two, if I were to lose node one or I were to lose node five in that system, the rest of the system's still up and running. So I'm not losing the entire network just because I've dropped traffic from one device. Between that and hold last look in a lot of our power control products, it keeps your lights from turning off just because the console did something weird or a gateway did something weird. Questions? I don't know if it's the right time, but can you Sure. The question is, if you're going to create a, a lighting network, I'm going to paraphrase your question a little bit if that's okay, but tell me if I'm wrong. If I'm creating a lighting network, can I really turn that into more of a theatrical network and add audio or point of sale ticket or assisted audio or other things onto that network at the same time? Um, and the answer is you can. Um, you want to be careful how you filter that out and how you work through your addressing, which is something I'm going to talk about in this class. Uh, you just want to be aware of what your overall bandwidth is so that you're not taking away too much bandwidth. That's, that's the place where you start running into problems. Um, in most theatrical environments, I don't want to say all of them, but in most theatrical environments, you can use a lot of out of the box or low level enterprise hardware to be able to solve a lot of these problems. When you start getting into larger facilities, museums, theme parks, things like that, you need to start being a little bit more careful about how you route that traffic. But if you're talking about you know, your standard 3,000 seat or less theater, you're probably going to be able to share that wire. Would you agree? You didn't frown too much at me. I got a shrug. All right. If I can get a shrug from Tracy as opposed to a, oh my god, why did you say that? I feel like I've got a victory. Um, any other questions? They keep me honest in the back of the room. And then they take notes on all the stuff they have to correct me on. So, All right. Uh, if there aren't any other questions, I want to go through and do an overview on ETC's network products. You're going to spend a lot more time playing with some of these during the rest of the class, but again, I just kind of want to explain what we make and how they work together. So the first one is uh, the Net3 DMX RDM gateways. These devices are essentially a network to DMX translator. So what we're doing with these devices is they're receiving a network connection in they can be configured to output DMX, whether it's a single port or a two port or a four port. You can configure each of those individual ports to support a different universe or, mo or the same universe of streaming ACN, and that's how we route the data through so that we can get from our EOS or our GEO at 5 console to our desire fixture, right? Because the desire fixture is not a network based device. So they support streaming ACN, they support DMX, they support RDM protocols. The four port versions of the that three DMX RDM gateways were sledded. How many of you have sledded four port gateways? A couple people have those. So those were designed so that you could put different sleds in the back if they were, if they were failing or you wanted to change the connections. You could just simply swap the sleds as needed to. Uh, they support all uh, DMX universes, so you've got one to 65,000 possible outputs that you can configure for that. Uh, they're compact, it's a desktop device, uh, specifically the four ports. We also make a 19-inch rack kit, 
So if you wanted to put these into an equipment rack, you could. It'll support either two of them, or we make a, a turnaround kit that goes in the back, so you plug into the sleds in the back, and it wraps around with some cables so that you have those ports directly on the front. I see a couple of people nodding because they probably have a couple of those as well. LCD display on the front for information in some configuration. These work over either an external power supply or they can be controlled via power over ethernet. So power over ethernet works by injecting power onto some of the unused pins on a category five cable so that you can control and power your devices. The new hotness, those are the old hotness, the new hotness is the response gateway. So slightly different form factors for these. Uh, part of it is the, the biggest change between the response gateways and the Net3 DMX RDM gateways. Um, the biggest change is, well, we call it response, right? We wanted to kind of, part of the reason for that is Net3 is a protocol, so having a Net3 gateway and a Net3 protocol got confusing for a lot of people because they assumed that any other gateway we had didn't speak Net3. Not always the truth. I see some heads nodding. But yeah, that was confusing. You're right, it was. Uh, so we fixed that. The other big change here is for the four ports is we stopped doing sleds. Um, what we found was not a lot of people bought new sleds or swapped their sleds after they bought the gateways. Um, there were a couple of fairly popular models that we sold. The, number, the most popular one is the terminal strip version. Uh, the second most popular one was a single male and three females. Um, so what we did is we made all of the different versions available now so you can have either all RJ45 jacks if you wanted to DMX over RJ45. That's not Ethernet, by the way. That's just DMX over a different piece of cable. Uh, you have the terminal strip, four, four male, four female, one male, three female um, are just available. By doing this, it allowed us to do a couple of things. Number one, come up with a better form, come up with a, a, a nicer form factor, I think. Um, number two, we were able to drop the price on these significantly. Well, the, if I remember correctly from yesterday, we were able to drop the price by uh, $700. Six, five? Six. Okay. Oh, I thought I saw two thumbs. $600. $600, not seven. Not seven, six. Uh, we were able to drop 600 yeah, everybody would have really liked me, um, but then my paycheck would have gotten a little smaller and my kid would have now gone back to State College. Nothing wrong with State College. I went to one. <laughs> yes? Uh, ports 3 and 4 still offer slower DMX speeds on the response compared to the Net3 gateways? Nope. Ports, all, all of the ports offer the same speeds. Okay. Nope. Am I wrong? Tracy? Ports 3 and 4 do, are, do have a capability to run slower than ports 1 and 2, identically to the, the older hardware. Yeah, ignore what I just said. Um, so ports three and four do have the ability to alter your speed and run at a slower speed. Sometimes I say things and then I say them right in a moment. Yes? If I'm, if I'm in a building that's been hardwired with Net2, mm -hmm. is there one item that I can just switch out to Net3 or is the whole system all the way through to the outlets going to be switched? When you say it was hardwired for Net2, does that just mean the cabling? The cabling and everything. Yeah. Uh, the, if the, if the, the, the cabling doesn't matter. So the difference between the, the wiring topology for Net2 and Net3, it's identical. It's all Ethernet-based communication. So you shouldn't have to change any of the infrastructure. Um, what you may have to look at, however, is what your nodes are doing and what they're capable of communicating on. Some of our gateways give you the ability to communicate via Net2. The, D, the older Net3 DMX RDM gateways could be put into a Net2 mode so that those would speak net to. The response gateways do not. Was that right? Yeah, I was just saying that right there is why I changed the name of the Yeah. That that's the biggest, that's the other big reason why we called it the response. So, you know, I would say why don't we try and chat offline and we can talk specifics in your system and what you might need to switch. Uh, but... You've got to. Yep. You've got the main theater that was net two. We uh, updated the black box theater to net three with the ability to switch because when it was first installed, there was an issue and everything else, we were actually using it as net too. Mm -hmm. That's been corrected now. Perfect. Um, it, depending on the specific products you have in your theater, and that's why I'd rather talk to you offline, is depending on the specific control and power products you have in your larger theater is going to determine how much would need to swap out in order to move to Net3. The, what, I will be able to, what I can tell you, though, is that the wiring infrastructure, the connections, the cables, all of the termination points that you have will not. That's all based on Ethernet. So you're, you're just going to have to you, It's easy. You just swap all your gear, right? Um. <laughs> well, but that's a lot cheaper than having to swap all your wire. Um, and that's one of the reasons that, that Ethernet has an advantage. But yeah, let's, let's talk offline. Another question. Uh, yeah, no, I'm just um, tagging on to the, the change in the data speed on ports 3 and 4. Can we not 
do that on port one and two? You can, but not to such a lower extent. Yeah, so, so for those of you that are online, because um, I have to repeat for them, uh, the question was, uh, you can change the data speeds on port three and four, can you not do that to one and two? And the answer that somebody else gave in the class, which I'm glad because I didn't know, uh, was you can, but not to the same extent. So we use some various speeds um, and you can change it. Does everybody know why you might want to change DMX speeds? No, Dave, why don't you explain it? <laughs> um, so I think a couple people actually did know. Um, so Anne, I'm sorry for, for stepping over you with my joke there. That was, uh, but because I know you know because you've dealt with this. Um, but the reason you may want to change DMX speed is depending on what you have connected. Various manufacturers use different chips and crystals inside of their DMX gear, and if they're using an older or a slower chip you may need to slow down the DMX speed going to those individual devices. Um, I used to run into this a lot, because I'm old, um, trying to connect DMX, or n newer ETC consoles, like the Expression, to older dimming systems like Colortran D192. Um, again, I'm old, where well, those had been retrofitted from D192 to DMX, and you had to slow the DMX speed down in order to control them. I saw a lot of this also with some early IntelliBeam type fixtures and, and stuff. So that's, I'm not going to pick on anybody new because that's not fair and I'm being recorded. Um, <laughs> but the truth is you may need to slow your DMX speed down for other things and that's why we put that capability in. And all of our consoles have done that for a really long time. Um, so with these to come back, was that all the questions? Did anybody else have a question? Okay, yes? Why do you like, like uh, how can you tell if you need to slow your DMX speed down? Does it not work or does it just create artifacts that not work? Sure. Uh, the question was, how do you know when you need to slow your DMX speed down? Does it not work? Does it just create artifacts on the network? Um, and the answer to that is yes. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, typically what you'll run into is either nothing or a data error on the devices or a lot of really weird flickering and flashing or an indeterminacy in the signals. Um, one of the things I used to see a lot was, especially in moving head fixtures, is that it wouldn't consistently go back to the same position. Not because that was an inherent design flaw, but because you were running into a specific data issue. Um, or if you swap from one port to another or you plug a different console in and it suddenly works, or you've removed the node and plugged directly into the device and it suddenly starts working, those are some indications. So, you know, when you're changing the speed, we're, we're talking about microseconds in speed between super fast and super slow. So, when in doubt, if it's being weird, I usually start by trying to change the speed because that's easy. It doesn't involve me having to do much other than push a couple of buttons so I can stay lazy and stay at my, de at my desk. Um, and you're not really going to notice, right? If you go from fast speed to slow speed, it's not like you're suddenly going to get this noticeable change on all of your dimmers. It's, it's happening so quickly, but it can make a difference. It's a good question. Any other questions before we move on? All right. Uh, so, we do make these in a couple of form factors, the fours we've already talked about. We also do a DIN rail mount, uh, one port and four port uh, that's terminal strip only. Uh, so those are, those are easy to just, if you want to have them, you can put them in single places. So rather than doing all the different form factors that we did, we now make those. We also make some specialty gateways. I like to call these specialty gateways because they, they kind of fit different niches. So when we're not dealing with DMX as our, as our primary protocol that we need to get on and off of an Ethernet based system. These give us uh, a couple of other options to do. So we make a 0 to 10 volt gateway. This takes streaming ACN in and controls 0 to 10 volt protocol either sync or source. We use this specifically for four wire fluorescent and LED dimmable, four, two wire LED dimmable drivers. Uh, so this gives you the ability to get that 0 to 10 control. So you'd have your power coming from your, one of your power controllers or a switching device and then you can use this to actually facilitate the dimming of those individual drivers. Uh, we do a show control gateway. We do a show control gateway. Uh, the show control gateway is designed specifically so that we can support uh, transference of either MIDI or MIDI show control or SMPTE. It um, converts it into essentially an ACN protocol, which then will get it out to your console or back and forth. So this gives you the ability of, say, you're having to deal with SMPTE or MIDI, and that generator is not going to be directly close to your console where you can plug into the connections at the desk itself. You can use a show control gateway to be able to get that information to transfer. So it, this converts it into an, an Ethernet-based protocol that goes back and forth on the wire. Not something that you're going to use every day, but when you need one, boy, is this a lot handier than having to run a couple extra hundred feet of SMPTE cable. 
because that's not fun. We also do an I.O. gateway. Uh, the I.O. gateway supports either 24 0 to 10 volt analog inputs. Uh, it also supports the RS-232 protocol, so if you need to communicate with RS-232 devices like, say, an AMX or a Crestron panel. Um, and it also supports 16 relays that act as contact closure outputs. So if you need to be able to trigger some remote closures for various devices or you need to get a remote closure input, uh, that triggers something in the console, this would give you the ability to do that. So let's say you, you, if you're trying to connect with some third-party contact-based system, this gives you a way to be able to get that information in, and most importantly, to be able to inject it on the wire so you can now take advantage of your network and the distance, the distance abilities on your network as opposed to having to deal with the distance limitations of an analog wire. Yes? Um, the I.O. gateway, can you use that to control RS-232 devices, like projectors and things, or do you need an actual Yeah, unit? absolutely you can. The question was, can I use the RS-232 RS on the I.O. gateway to control something like a projector, or is it just input? And the answer is it's bidirectional. Okay. So you could send commands. Um, there's, there's, I don't want to get super deep into the weeds on console programming for this, but you can attach command structure into like a macro, for example. Um, I've done this specifically with contact closures, both inputs and outputs, where from the console you can say in a macro, or even attaching it to a queue, contact one on, contact two off, um, things of that nature, or when I receive a contact to be able to act on it. Whether you're directly wired to the console or you're wired to this gateway, it'll trigger those, bo both of those contacts. So, so yeah, you can absolutely use this to communicate with things like a projector. Any other questions on it? All right. Uh, last, but certainly not least, and the newest, funnest hotness, Lowell's favorite specialty gateway, is the Net3 conductor. Um, these are awesome. It is a network monitoring device. It supports the ACN protocol. It saves log files and configurations. It lets you do updates to your facility. It lets you log and transmit data information. It stays crunchy in milk. It does all the things <laughs> that you would want a specialty gateway to do. And you're going to spend a lot more time talking about these, and you're probably going to want one by the end of the day. Um, so I'm not going to go too much further into them. So um, when we're talking about this to kind of tie all of this together, this is kind of this is a common network configuration. So this is where, as we're putting everything together and hooking it all up, you've got your computer, you've got some sensor racks, you've got a response, some response gateways, maybe some paradigm products, an IRFR app, your EOS TI or Geo or the brand new hotness, which I didn't know we were releasing or I would have updated the slide, because blatant commercialism rocks. Um, and all of these things are connecting up via the topologies, topologies we just talked to into your network infrastructure, which I refer to as uh, a, a cloud. I call it the cloud. Now, this is not the same as cloud-based computing. Um, I draw this as a cloud just to indicate that this could be a number of switches, a number of hubs, a number of hops, whatever it is that you're doing inside that network infrastructure to make it work. Can we agree that that's what that cloud represents? You'll grant me that for at least today? Perfect. For other people are like, well, I don't understand. Does this mean I can hook it up to iCloud? No, 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 no. It's, this is just the, uh, all your network stuff. So now that we know how this stuff wires up, and now that we know the pieces that we need to put into place to do it, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit. I want, first off, I want to see if there's any questions. And then what I want to talk about is how you actually get these devices to be able to talk to each other. So any questions on anything we've talked about so far? See, once I told you what I was going to talk about next, that like killed all your questions. Right? It's like, I want to hear that next part. So let's talk about it, right? We have our nodes, we have our switches, we have all of these pieces that are wired together. We've talked through pretty much how the physical layer of this works. So let's talk about the communications layer. Um, and this is done through a series of, of different addresses that all work within this Ethernet protocol. These are also defined in 802.3 to determine how devices are going to talk with and communicate with each other. Um, there's a MAC address, or th what they are, I jumped ahead of myself, is we have a MAC address, an IP address, a subnet mask, and a default gateway. These are probably terms you may or may not have heard, you may have heard of, you probably had to assign them at least to some piece of equipment at some point in time. I want to talk a little bit about what they are and how they work. Uh, the first one is a MAC address. The MAC address is a unique number. Uh, the MAC, MAC addresses are permanently set by manufacturers. So every node has a unique MAC address. Every piece of network equipment, every node that you own has a unique MAC address. Each of the pieces of equipment on your tables, whether it's an ETC piece of equipment or those Cisco switches or your mobile device or your phone or your computer, every network connection that the device has has a unique MAC address. It's permanently set by the manufacturer so that they are all unique. 
It is a six octet number. Does everybody know the term octet, understand what the term octet means? No, Dave, explain it. Okay, I will. Um, so an octet refers to a numerical range that can be anywhere from 0 to 255. It is an octet because when we're dealing with binary, we're talking about binary 8, right? So all ones in a binary system to the eighth place is 255. That's just how it adds up. Anybody ever address IntelliBeams or dip switch based fixtures? You kind of know what I'm talking about there, right? Because as you flip them on, this is where you get to. And when you get to the eighth place, you get to 255. Um, different from all of the other octet based addressing that we're going to be looking at, the MAC address actually addresses everything in hexadecimal because engineers are geeks. Um, so these are the jokes. That's like as funny as addressing gets. Uh, but that's how this comes together. So within this, the way MAC addresses are created is the first three octets are assigned to a manufacturer. So as ETC, we got assigned an octet to you, uh, these, these numbers to use. And in the case of ETC gear, it's 00C016. That is our number that has been assigned. So that's the number that we get and the number that we use. Then within that number range, every individual device that we manufacture gets assigned with the last three octets. And it's up to the manufacturers to decide how they want to assign that. So this is how everything gets addressed. And you can see these MAC addresses at times if you're ever looking at logs or you're looking at data information. This is kind of the first weird number that shows up as a bunch of numbers and letters. That's identifying that specific piece of equipment. This is also what the switch uses as it creates device tables to know how to communicate between devices. Because regardless of all the other communication protocols that might exist, this one is not going to ever change, right? The device that is talking is going to use this MAC address as an identifier, so the switch can use this address to determine how it's going to communicate. And that is an oversimplification of that level of communication and device tabling. The next one is the IP address, the internet protocol address. This again is a numerical label. This needs to be unique for every single node in that the numbers, you don't want to share IP addresses. If you have two devices that have the same IP address, per, I, triple, uh, per, per 802.3 rules, what happens is if you have two nodes on the network that have the same IP address, they will recognize each other, recognize the conflict, and they will each randomly turn, they will each turn off for a random period of time and then try and turn on again hoping that the other one has resolved its conflict. So they'll come online, they'll go offline. They'll come online, they'll go offline until you change the IP address in one of the two products and then they will both come online. Uh, so that number needs to be completely unique. Again, this is four octets, different from a MAC address in that A, it's four and not six, but also this uses a numerical range from zero to 255 as opposed to hexadecimal. So this is using, so you can actually understand what these numbers are. Thankfully, the geeky engineers didn't make us all have to learn hexadecimal to the 255th place. How many of you know that anyway? Awesome. Don't address your nodes hexadecimally, it won't work. Um, it actually will only accept numbers, but these go from zero to 255. So we have four octets that are used here. Typically, the first two numbers in this IP range are what are, are what are considered to be a network ID. This defines the overall size of that network and, and how devices are going to communicate together. And again, for those of you that are familiar with a lot of high-end computer addressing, I'm going to say two things. Number one, this is a simplification, so I, I'm, I could do an entire class on addressing schemes, but we have other things to do and you'd all beat me with sticks. Um, and number two, I'm talking in a lot of ways here specifically about how ETC is using this address layer to get ETC equipment online and working. So for those of you that are like, but, uh, um, but understand those, those caveats as we go a little further. So at ETC, we're using those first two octets as our network ID. This is what's defining the size of that network and what the scope is going to be. The other two are the node ID. So specifically to ETC, we're using these to identify not only the network that we're talking on, but equipment. And one of the handouts you'll find in an electronic version on your USB sticks is a document that I put together that lists the IP ranges for every single ETC product so that you know what those ranges are. Because the way we're setting those up and the way we're using them uh, to come over here and, and kind of point at it is we're defining this network ID and then we use these two numbers to define the family or the range of products. So the third octet is a number that we use to identify what product family that lives in. And then the last octet that we use is the one we use to identify gear. So for example, for sensor three products, we're gonna use the network ID of 10.101 and then our node ID is 101.101 .101 for the first rack, 
101.102 for the second rack, 101.103 for the third rack, etc. So that way they get some unique identifiers and they get some unique information. This is kind of how we put it together. If you're still kind of struggling with exactly how an IP address works and what it does, uh, let me put it in a simpler example. <laughs> so let's say you wanted to call me at ETC. And you would dial our phone number, 800-688-4116. And surprisingly, we don't have just a phone in the factory and whenever it rings, like a thousand people run over to it to wait to see who it's for. Um, we have a transferring system. So when you call into the front desk and you talk to Joe and you say, I'd like to speak with David Fox, please, she'll say, oh yeah, sure, you betcha. And she will transfer you to my extension, which is 5056. <laughs> And an IP address works pretty much the exact same way. You're calling into that network ID, which determines, hey, when I, co when I contact this, I'm trying to reach ETC. And then using the extension or the node ID determines which individual product you're trying to communicate with. That's how IP addressing works, whether it's with us or with anybody else that you're playing with. Make sense? Kind of clear? That is my phone number, too, by the way. So feel free to copy that down. Often I'm in places like this, but I always do return my phone calls. So the next thing I want to talk about is a subnet mask. Uh, subnet mask is the next part of the IP address layer that you need to put in and work through. Uh, what the subnet mask does is it, it, it helps to secure the network and it helps to define the size of the network. So a subnet mask, again, is a four octet range. Uh, typically, there are only two numbers that get used in subnet masking, especially for what we're doing. Now, in, in larger, bigger infrastructure networks, you can get a lot more complicated with this, but for what we're working with and for what we deal with in theater, we're looking at two numbers that get used, either 255 or zero. So if you see the number 255 in a subnet mask, what that means is that that number place has to be identical between nodes in order for that communication to pass. If you see a zero, it means it doesn't matter what that number is in order to allow communication between those two nodes to pass. So by addressing something as 255.255.0.0, what that means is in order for that node to be able to talk with or receive information from another node is they have to have the same network ID. right? They have to both be addressed at 10.101 in order to pass communication between one another. If the node were to receive a piece of information from another device that didn't have that same IP address, like your audio system, it would ignore that piece of information. It's not going to try and process it because it's not part of that network. This is subnetting. This is how people break networks down. This is how you can have your audio system and your ticketing system and your assisted listening system all sharing that same piece of wire without having to worry about somebody inadvertently affecting a queue or affecting output from your dimmer racks because of the way the audio system is working because it's easy to blame the audio guys, right? Any audio guys in the room? One per it's easy to blame the lighting guys too, right? It's always their fault. They're hogging the bandwidth anyway. Um, all those ones and zeros, that's for my audio. Uh, so these are the two numbers that you're going to run into and see. It's either going to be 255 or it's going to be zero. Our standard default out of the box subnet is 255.255.0.0. The last number that you work with is what's called the default gateway. This one can get a little complicated. Uh, the default gateway is used by a node to say, if I am trying to communicate with another node on the network and that node, I, that node does not exist, that IP address cannot be found anywhere else on the network, I'm going to send my information to this address instead. Uh, primarily, the gateway address is used when you're starting to work with large routed systems, and I'll talk more about that in a second. Um, but that's, that's what that's used for, is it's used to route that information to a secondary router or a secondary device for a large system so that you can share it. However, comma, a lot of Windows operating system products and a lot of other products that you work with out there need to have something in this address because you might say, well, I have a small system and I'm not using a router and I'm only communicating from there to there, so I don't need this gateway address. But a lot of equipment, if it doesn't have a default gateway, doesn't pass any network communication whatsoever. Windows machines in particular um, are, are notorious in some of the operating systems for if there's no default gateway, they just won't even activate that network port. That's always fun to troubleshoot, right? Nothing's working, I can't tell why. Um, or if you boot it and it doesn't have the default gateway. So we use this number in all of our gear so that we put that default gateway in to avoid that potential conflict. And the, the good default gateway we use is 10.101.1.1. Now I mentioned that you might be working with a larger system. 
And if you're working with a larger system or a routed system, um, and typically you might find this in, in places like universities. Uh, remember the fiber example we talked about earlier? Kind of heads moving. I know that was like so 10 minutes ago, right? Um, but in that routed system where we're going into a fiber hub, that fiber hub is going to get an IP address so that it knows how to communicate with things on the network. That would be our gateway, right? That's going to get us from one network to another or from one, side of a, a, so from one side of a network to another. So it allows us to communicate between two completely separate logical networks. It also gives us the ability to, to do some translation between two different network types. So if I have network one that is addressed at 10.101.something.something, and I have another network that is addressed as 10.120.something.something, by default those two devices are not going; those networks are not going to be able to talk to each other, right? Because the IP addresses don't match. So our subnet is going to block that traffic. But if I have a default gateway or I have a router involved, I can have one side of that router listening to the 10.101 side and one side of that router listening to the 10.120 side and get the ability to communicate between those two devices via the router. Big systems, large facilities can use this, but I also am starting to see more and more of this being used in facilities where let's say you have three different theaters that are all using Net3 gear and you're sharing infrastructure because they all got wired together because maybe you might want to totally do that one day. But in practice, you want to make sure that your ION console isn't by default controlling the wrong dimmers in another theater. I got a couple of people nodding their heads because nobody wants that. Thank you. Um, so this, you know, putting a router in between gives you the ability to get that communication back and forth from, say, a single conductor unit without having to worry about all the other nodes talking in a way that they shouldn't. So that's how a routed system comes together and how they work. They can be bigger or smaller. So if we look at our common network configuration as we pull some of this together, as we start going through and addressing the devices, this is what we can come down to. So assuming now that we look back at the same map and we're using our default subnet mask of 255.255.0.0 and our default gateway of 10.101.1.1, these are going to be your out-of-the-box addresses. So one of the reasons why we set this scheme up in such a way was to make sure that when you bought the stuff, pulled it out of the box, plugged it in, without having to do a whole lot of addressing configuration, these things are just going to work together. But if you're adding more components or you need to modify things or change them, you absolutely can change your addressing scheme to anything you want it to be, but this gives you an idea of how things are coming in out of the box. So obviously your computer is something you would need to address, right? Because unless you bought it from us, and hey, we sell computers. I'm, I'll sell office chairs if you want me to, that's fine. <laughs> you laugh, it happens, right? If, if you're working in a facility where you get one PO for your theater, we'll be more than happy to sell. I've sold reams of paper, I've sold sheets of gel, anything. Um, we'll do it. Lowell's laughing. You know we've done it. Oh, I know we've done it. Yeah, you've written some of those. Love um, penguin. One, one penguin? Long story. Long, okay, fair enough. I, yeah, that's that. I only have ten minutes. I, I can't hear the penguin story now. I really want to though. Um, so you know, your computer you're going to have to address. But the TI coming out of the box, 10.101, our standard numbers. The range for that product family starts with 9, .92.101. Your IRFR is going to start with 125.101. Your first paradigm processor is going to be 10.101. It's going to be up to you or your installing technician if they're adding multiple devices to update that last octet so that we don't create an IP conflict. But if you only have one of these devices that's going in, these are the default ranges that they're just going to plug into. So when you connect all of these things back up to your network, by default they're not going to have any conflicts and they're going to be able to talk to each other. This is the base core for how networking, network addressing works. Does this make sense to everybody? Does anybody have any questions on this? Yes. Um, I move around from place to place with Nomad on my PC, mm -hmm. laptop, mm -hmm. which is my laptop for everything. Sure. So my Nomad always takes the PC, the IP address from the PC, so I don't get your, I don't get the ETC mm -hmm. configuration. I get a 168, whatever. Right, right. Is there any way to deal with that? Um, the question is, I don't know your name. I'm sorry. 
John, John moves around a lot, and we're not going to judge him for that. Um, but John moves around a lot, and in his travels, he's using a nomad in a wide variety of places. And what he finds is that it's not taking this default. It's using the IP address of wherever his computer is set, which is probably set to a generic or a link local address so that he can obtain an address from wherever network he's plugging into. Is there a way to deal with that? Um, and the answer is yes. Uh, there are a number. You, you can create some, some specific network profiles on your computer and go back to using those. Personally, I use a program called IP Switcher. It's a, it's a free download, and what IP Switcher lets you do is create a series of um, profiles. So when I, when I switch from network to network, I open this up, I choose the network I want to, I choose the network connection that I'm using, and I launch that particular profile. So I have one for ETC networks, so that when I click it, it just assigns my network credentials. Um, I did that because I just didn't want to have to keep navigating into control panel, network, local area network, TCP IP properties, and then changing it, right? So I just have a couple of default profiles that I use. Uh, Tracy, you use a different one, right? You use... Netset Man Pro. Yeah, Tracy uses Netset Man Pro, um, which does some better things, but it, you have to pay for it, and that's money, man. Uh, so I didn't... Um, it does some better things, and it does some different things, and it works on boot, right? So when you boot up the computer, you can assign the network protocols without even having to have finished the launch process. Uh, there's people that write scripts and use some standard, um, some standard executable scripts that just live on their desktop, and that's, that's the easiest way to get around it is, you know, I have a couple of different profiles that I have for wired ETC network, wireless ETC network, my home network, my work network, and then I just don't have to remember what those numbers are. Um, one of the things I also do because... I get around a bit too sometimes, is um, I don't use the, the default of 1.101 on my laptop because I never, because if, I assume somebody else is already using that. So if I'm going into a theater, I use a different number. I use 1.113 personally because that way I know if I plug in and somebody else is on a network and they have a computer plugged in, I'm probably not going to create an IP conflict just by joining that network. So if you have a tendency to travel around to a lot of facilities, you may not want to use the default for your computer either. Just don't use 113 because I own that trademark registered copy. Um, <laughs> I don't. Um, and you can use any number between 1 and 254. So you can put whatever number you want in there. What was that, Lil? I use 156.42. Yeah. Because I know nobody else uses that. Yeah, 156.42. So 10.101.156.42. Don't write that down. Yeah, that works. And you can do that, right? Because the way the subnet's set up, you could totally use both of those octets in whatever way that you wanted to without ever generating a conflict. So that's, that's how this addressing protocol works. We are running short on time. I've got about five minutes, so I am more than happy to um, answer any of those pressing questions that you had um, that you hadn't that you hadn't asked yet um, on anything that we've talked about so far. Yes. So uh, going back to addressing rather than working under TACP, mm -hmm. is there actually no looking for an available address and getting an address? Who is assigning? Perfect question. I understand exactly what you're asking. His, his question is, how are these addresses getting assigned? Um, how, 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 do, how do nodes receive their addresses? Is it happening by a DHCP or is it happening by something else? That is a great question. Um, do you guys want to catch that in the next class, or do you want me to take a couple minutes and do a quick my quick overview on addressing styles? We're going to talk about uh, some different addressing options and DHCP servers in later classes. Okay. Uh, one thing I'll just say as a general recommendation, things that are physically bolted on the wall, like uh, dimmer racks uh, or RPUs or things like that, we do recommend a static IP address in a situation like that. Right. Uh, things that aren't moving. But if you've got gateways that are coming in out of your system, you know, no, today I'm using two, tomorrow I'm using six, Thursday I'm using five, uh, that's a, an application where DHCP can be a little bit more useful. Um, and we'll talk about uh, Conductor has a DHCP server built in and some of the ways we talk about doing that in a little bit. Yeah, I saw, I saw you had a hand up, and I'll get you in just a second. Um, but for, for those of you that heard all that and you're like, that was a whole bunch of words and initials and I don't get it, um, gu I guarantee they are going to take some more time to talk about it, but, but how you address your devices is critical, right? That was, that's kind of the next piece of this puzzle is we know how they need to be addressed to talk to each other, but how do they get that? And the difference between static and DHCP, dynamic host control protocol, is a static IP address is something you physically set in a piece of gear. 
and because you've set it, it's not going to change. Versus the dynamic host control protocol where the device and other devices on the network have the ability to assign IP addresses. When we're using a DHCP server, we're going to set it up so that we are assigning things in this default range. Question from over here. I saw a hand. I wasn't sure who raised it. Can you tell, talk more about the difference between Cat5, 6, and 7 cable and when you might want one, one over the other? Absolutely. Uh, the question was, can I talk more about Cat5, 6, and 7 cable and when I want one over the other? Um, the real differences between those cables are to, to oversimplify um, and see if I can make Tracy cringe at the same time, is, is uh, robustness and speed and shielding. So the different standards have different specific physical properties on that cable to use. Um, obviously, uh, 6 and 7 are going to have a faster data transmission than 5 is. Uh, for most theatrical environments, it really doesn't make that big of a difference. So you know, it might just be whichever one you're getting um, as part of the installation. Um, a lot of people are looking to future-proof and specify things like Cat 6 and Cat 7, um, just because in some, in some regions it's easier to find. Um, and in other regions, they're looking to say, well, in the future, I might need to deal with different forms of addressing schemes like IPv6 or something like that. And in that case, I want to make sure that my network infrastructure is going to be able to support it. Um, I don't know personally, and the guys in the back of the room may disagree with me, that it's necessarily worth the additional cost of specifying those specific wires for most of the theatrical systems that you're going to be putting in. Um, but if your contractor comes to you and says, hey, can I run CAT6 and can I terminate to CAT6 connections instead, is that OK? And the answer is, yeah, that's totally fine. CAT5, CAT6, CAT7 connectors are all the same. So the only difference at that point is the physicality of the wire. Um, you may find them rated, but they're the same enough that they will plug in together. Can we agree to that? You, you can plug a lower grade uh, RJ45 connection into a higher grade jack on the wall. Mm -hmm. So 7 won't go into a 5, but 5 will go into a 7. Right. Yes? Have you found any problems um, with older Cat5 systems? So my, my, my ability for example, was 2001. Mm -hmm. Question is, have we found issues with older network installations, um, specifically things done at the turn of the century? You can say that now, right? And, and, it, and it means like something new. Um, yeah, the turn of the millennia. I like turn of the century. I still refer to these as the aught years. Uh, but the answer is yes. Uh, depending on the wire that got put in, you could absolutely run into some, some speed issues and some infrastructure issues. Uh, one of the biggest things I saw in a lot of cases, especially with like Obsession 2 network installations that went in, is they didn't have switches. They had, they had hubs. Um, some of the early uh, iterations of, of Net1 gear for us um, did not do TCP IP addressing. So we handled addressing in a completely different way. So you couldn't put a switch in for like an Obsession 1 system because it had no way to be able to pass that data or communicate it. So if you have an older system, the wire's probably going to be OK again for the theatrical speeds that you're looking at. But you might need to look at swapping some of your infrastructure. I'm being told that I'm out of time. So I'm going to need to wrap this up. I will be around for the rest of the day. Um, I'm available for lunch. Thank you. Those of you that tuned in online, uh, you may resume your Saturday morning cartoons as per usual. Um, and with that, uh, I want to thank you all. I unfortunately have to dash, so if you have any additional questions about what we talked about, grab me at lunch, grab me between classes, and grab me at a break, but I've got another class I need to